Dearly beloved, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Are there any questions? Is that clear? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> day by day, you see. Well, let's let's suppose there might be some questions, and let's perhaps offer some clarification. First of all, it does not say, just as you would like men to respond to you, so you should respond to them, though that does follow, because responding is one possible way of doing unto others. But that would limit the gospel if we only applied it in that manner. So this gospel does not apply only to reactions, but to, if you will, proactions. That is not just to say how we react and respond to others, but how we initiate our relationships with them. Now when we hear, lend to others, and hope for nothing in return, we assume that means they initiated it, because why would we lend something unless somebody asked us first? But the two preceding statements of this gospel show that we are clearly meant to be proactive and not reactive about this. Love those who do not love you. That is to say, be the first one to love. And maybe by your goodness and your love, they will also be brought to love you in return. Maybe. Do good to those who have not yet done any good to you. And maybe they will be moved to do some good as well. But maybe they won't. And so therefore, the third statement makes perfect sense. Lend hoping nothing in return. Because when you love someone, especially your enemy, who you can't expect reasonably to be loved back by, or you good, do good to others who have not ever done any good to you, you are, in effect, lending, hoping for nothing in return. To love without condition, to do good without expectation, to lend without hope of return. Be the first to show kindness without it being a reaction, without having been asked, without having been approached. Do it when it is least expected. Don't wait to be asked. Don't wait until the opportunity appears before you. The gospel calls us to go out and make the opportunity happen. Don't wait and hope somebody in need stumbles upon you. Go out and find the person that you know darn well is hurting, that you know is in need, that you know needs your help, but would not find you if you stay in your comfortable and safe little selves. Find them before they find you, and you will be living the way the gospel has actually enjoined us. I don't know how to do that, Father. That just sounds too much for me. Well, you know, first of all, coming to church is one of those actions. You are going forward, leaving the comfort of your own home in the morning, and coming to a place where you can do good for others before you leave. The church, in fact, is meant to be a training ground for you. This is the school in which the sinner learns to be a saint. So we come together to practice this way of life, the way of life and the resurrection, as Christ is. So let us take an inventory of ourselves. Do we come and enjoy ourselves and the worship, the fellowship, the food, the good company, the friends we make, without bothering to get to know the stranger? Do I need to repeat that? <laughs> Do we enjoy our worship and hearing the sermon, but not bother to get to know the person who is next to us? Do we pat ourselves on the back for faithfully upholding the apostolic church, the faith which established the universe, without putting that practice 
that faith into practice with the person in the same view as us. Without acting on that faith with the person who is in pain or struggling. Or worse, when we see them not showing up as often as we would like or behaving the way we would like in church. Do we judge them for their weakness and their shortcomings and yet remain blind to our own? And lastly, do we wait until we are personally contacted, even begged, by someone in authority from the church to help at a function, or cajoled by the priest or a parish council member into getting involved, when if we lived the gospel as it is written, we would not have waited to be asked. We would have come forward and asked ourselves what we could do, and even better yet, we would have seen what needed to have been done, and we would have done it without even asking to do it. I don't know how many of you uh, noticed how bad the, the condition of the cross on the front of the church has been for the last two years. We've been meaning to take it down and strip it and refinish it. It's a pain, honestly. Um, on Friday and Saturday, a couple parishioners decided to just do it. They didn't even ask me for permission. They just did it. That's awesome. I'm glad. I'm grateful. But would we rather want to feel like the person who is made to feel special, made to feel important, made to feel like I matter, and therefore I'll wait until, dang it, I get that phone call, personally, before I step foot into doing some project that I know very well the church can suffer. Do I choose to be self-important rather than to model myself after the most important person who has ever lived? He who never asked for recognition, who never grasped for praise or power or authority, but to whom belongs all honor, worship, and glory forever and ever. And if such a path seems foolish and pointless, and not very pleasing, even self-negating, self-destructive. The Lord adds the phrase, and your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. That maybe, by appealing at least to our enlightened self-interest, we will realize that there is, in fact, a benefit to living the gospel life. A benefit greater, in fact, than anything we could have ever achieved on our own for all of our self-importance. Brothers and sisters, we were created in the image and likeness of God, according to the Bible. That's a very appealing teaching. That makes us feel very special. Now, our bodies might be little more than a fairly well-adapted chimpanzee frame, modified for urban living. But at least, the Bible tells us, that our humanity has a spiritual dimension, which not only transcends the animal kingdom, but in fact the entire created order. That's wonderful. But through sin, we lose the likeness to our Heavenly Father. In Christ Jesus, we have seen the likeness made complete. And He teaches us how we may live so that that likeness may be restored in us and see sin destroyed. And it's really quite simple. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Be kind to the unthankful and evil. Love as He has loved you, even those who hated you as they hated Him. If you want to be like God, act like God. Don't wait for an excuse or a reason or a sufficient motivation from your fellow human beings. That, in fact, is the sinner's path, and there are many who find it. Even chimpanzees know how to love those who love them. If any of you like the old uh, Planet of the Apes movies or the new ones, you know what the lesson of that story is. 
The humans were no better. In fact, they were worse. And that's how they got that way. Be more, brothers and sisters, than the sinners. Be more than the chimpanzees. Be not just like Christ, but become a Christ, an anointed child of God. Be what you, in fact, were made to be. Be what you are meant to be. Christ is among us. He is our shopping.